fewer and fewer people come to class. That's general paradigm. I'm kind of surprised given that the stream broke last week. It went on two. The laptop just stopped being able to talk to the network. I came in early today to make sure I could get it to work right. And be able to. We'll probably do until the next random time it stops. All right. Is this lighting working for anyone? I can turn the lights down a little bit, which will make it harder for you to see what's in front of you, but might make it easier to see what's up there. They didn't even turn the screens down, did they? All right, well, if somebody complains, I can change things. Otherwise, I'll just leave it the way it is. So today is November 2nd, 2023. Logistics, boring, boring. All I did was take the stuff off that was five o'clock today and that left next week. So, boring too. Today's failure is actually three failures, um, two of which I used last term. I just lumped them together. And then the third one was because I found them all together on one blog post where somebody was talking about failures in late 2022 and early 2023 and how the world was falling apart. Catastrophic software failures. Southwest Airlines had an IT meltdown. Southwest Airlines is a um, budget carrier in the United States that travels pretty much everywhere, but they don't use a hub and spoke system. It makes them different than most of the other airlines which do use hub and spoke. And in December of 2022, they had this massive meltdown that in the end, uh, they estimated would cost them about 725 to $825 million. Plus the $1.3 billion, that's B billion, that they were going to have to spend on upgrading their infrastructure. They had, um, there's a very interesting articles about that, talking about how they had a lot of home brewed stuff and over the course of four or five years, they had reduced headcount and staffing levels to such an extent that there weren't people who could fix it. So when things actually got bad, they got really, really, really bad. And this is one of the extreme examples of a distributed system. Airlines, I was just reading this article recently that said that airlines are actually not in the business buying people from point A to point B. Airlines are banks that happen to run airplanes as a sideline. That literally, at least in the US, the airlines are making money because of the miles that people put on like their credit cards and they get as rewards for things. That makes way more money than the actual flights. They still have incredibly complex IT infrastructure. One of the oldest known uses of AI is actually used in um, scheduling gates at airports. A company that specializes in this kind of software. Turns out it's a really hard problem because it's very dynamic, very fluid. Things are constantly changing. Less than a month later, the Federal Aviation Administration in the United States, which is the governmental agency responsible for managing the routing of airplanes in the US and for airports in general, had a pretty major outage that caused 7,000 canceled flights. And the interesting thing here is that didn't cost the FAA, it cost everyone else. So that particular cost was spread out amongst the airlines and the individual uh, people flying. I don't know if any of you ever been on a flight before? Any of you ever been on a flight that's been canceled before? What's the longest delay you've ever had on an airplane? Three hours? Two hours? The longest I've actually had is 30 hours. Um, that was a flight from Las Vegas to uh, London Gatwick. And basically, they had to fly a part in on the flight the next day. 
So it took them 20 some odd hours to get the part to Las Vegas, a few hours to put it on the plane, and then turn it around, load us back up, and fly the other direction. Last year, I actually had a flight that was delayed 23 and a half hours, the flight from here, Frankfurt. And the problem was that there was a, they, they did some maintenance on it, but it was an uh, Airbus A320 Neo, 20, I think it was a 320 Neo. They had no one in Canada they could find that was certified on the 320 Neo to sign off on the work. They had to fly someone in from Germany to Seattle, drive them up to Vancouver, have him sign off on the repair, and then he flew back with us on the plane one day later. So lots of things go wrong all of the time. And we talk about flight delays, but flight delays are caused by something that happens and then we need the IT infrastructure to be able to absorb that and to compensate for that. And so what you see is that when things are going bad elsewhere, the stress and strain increases on our IT infrastructure, which is, of course, exactly when things break. If you can think of the way that something can go wrong, it will. If you can think of something that can't possibly go wrong, it will go wrong. And when it goes wrong, you will not be able to get in and fix it. That was a big paraphrase of the Douglas Adams quotation from two lectures ago. And I really liked it because it very much fits this particular topic. The cause of the FAA outage was a single corrupted database file. Oops. They never, I, I didn't find anything that told us exactly what the corruption was, but this is when, when I talk about consistency, this is what I'm talking about. Most of the time, people consider it to be something that is inconsistent to be corruption, even if it's exactly what the software told it to do. That's different than when you go to try and read the file off of the media and you get back a, an unrecoverable read error. That's a, that's a hardware error that's outside of the scope of what we can individually protect against. We can protect against it, but we use different strategies to do that. One of the benefits of having a replicated system is if one of your replicas comes back and says, I'm sorry, I can't read that anymore, you've got another copy. That's the whole reason that we replicate things. There was a really cool New York Stock Exchange trading is uh, issue in January of this year, and it literally caused them to halt trading for several hours. That's a lot of money. I don't like adding up those kinds of numbers. They had to reverse transactions after the fact because there was a misconfiguration of the disaster recovery system. That was my favorite part. Oh, the stuff we built in order to take care of when things went wrong caused things to go wrong. It's a great field, but it can be a little stressful at times. So, Clubman chapter, chapter 6 is actually not a particularly long read. But there's a fair bit in there to unpack. And I'm going to probably touch on some things that aren't quite covered the same way. So I have a long list of learning goals, which are really just what is it we're talking about in this section? What is it you should be taking away from this? Um, so Clubman is using the term partitioning, and what I usually use is the term sharding. Sharding and partitioning are basically the same thing. It's splitting things up into subsets. Sometimes that's really easy. One of the reasons that we use key value stores is because they are trivially shardable. You handle all the even numbered keys, I handle all the odd numbered keys, or whatever. Hash the key value. Then we split it in half, or we split it in n ways. So it's very easy to do that, and it's easy for us to build systems that, that become a composition of these discrete key value stores. That's what Design Project 3 was all about. And Design Project 3 really delves into one of the complications of doing this, which is when you decide you want to move stuff between your different shards, you have a lot of work to do. You're moving actual data. Now, when you're doing it in a mock-up, like they're doing in, in um, Design Project 3, it's not that bad. It all fits in memory. You can just schlep it around in one big message. When it's a two and a half terabyte, 
database, it takes a little while to move that from here to um, Adelaide. Pick a random data center location. I'll touch, you know, there's a lot of terminology. And one of the fun things about this is, of course, keep using the same, use different words to mean the same thing, and we use the same words to use, mean different things. This is a, a barrier to entry. It, it's once you understand the context in which something means a particular thing, you become knowledgeable, and that means that you now know something that people who are outside don't know. And I, I'm kind of poking fun at, at IT for this. In tech, we do this a lot. And, and I see lots and lots of cases of this because we start with something, we name it something, and then the way that it actually works and the way we use it completely changes, but we keep the same exact name. Human nature it happens in all fields, but it definitely happens in ours as well. So how do we use partitioning to create scalability? That one shouldn't be too hard because I've been talking about it for a while now. But this is this Putman's take on it. One of the things that I didn't really talk very much about is when you begin to shard databases, you partition the databases into pieces, you have operations that now have to cross boundaries. We were literally just talking about this before class, which is when you start trying to process a graph, large graph, let's, let's take something with a, you know, I don't know, a billion vertices and 25 billion edges. That's kind of a nice sized graph. That's not going to fit on your, uh, on your MacBook. Not even the really big one with 128 gig of memory. But how do, how do we deal with that? How are we going to process that? One of the reasons we end up with this distributed system things is because they provide us with some tools that while complicated to implement and understand, they do allow us to scale up kinds of problems that we can address. But now I've split this thing up. And a graph was a really good example because in a graph, no matter how I split it up, there's always going to be some overlap between the partitions because a tree I can split really easily, right? You take a binary tree and you just, you just keep dividing it every so often. And it's trivially partitionable. Graphs are not trivially partitionable. No matter how you split up the graph, there are always going to be things that straddle that boundary. If you, if you split up your graph by vert vertex, then you're going to have edges that straddle boundaries. You'll have edges between two partitions. There's no guarantee that any given partition will only have connections to one other partition. What's more likely is that any given partition will have connections to all of the other partitions. Depends on the graph, depends on the structure of the graph. So when we partition graphs, we are very cognizant of how we partition them because we want to minimize the amount of communications we have to do between the partition. How hard could this possibly be? And I just gave you a little, a little graph, a billion, billion vertices and 25 billion edges. It's an open research problem. I mean, people still work on the best and optimal way to organize graphs in graph databases. We have lots of techniques, but it turns out it's a lot harder than you think it, it is. Or maybe you think it's hard now. So one of the things we do with databases to make things go faster is we build indices. Indices don't actually partition particularly well. Depends on the data set, again. So we're going to have to talk a little bit about how we deal with indexes when we start partitioning things up. Again, key value stores, we kind of destroyed and ignored all of those types of issues because key value stores are inherently partitionable, but they don't contain relationship information in the same way that an RDBMS does. We'll cover using Partitioning as a means of uh, fault tolerance. Replication in, partitioning and replication is a means of fault tolerance. We've talked about this before, so that's not a big takeaway. Uh, let's see. I've hinted at, but haven't explicitly talked about how you route requests. So when you've got this partitioned database, 
How do you know where to send the request? Someplace, someone has to make the decision, where do I send this? When we were doing this before in our Paxos-based system, we just sent it to the leader. But maybe that's not the right solution in all cases. Um, I'll talk briefly about the evolution of partitioning in the database community in particular, because this is not a new concept. It's been around for a while, and it's one that will not be going away anytime soon. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about workloads. And I'm just going to talk about two workloads. There's a transactional workload and an um, uh, analytic workload. And these are real, real world kinds of workloads. Uh, transaction workloads are things that you would do if you were building a shopping cart, for instance, because you're doing specific operations that need to be performed quickly because somebody's sitting there waiting for you to finish. Analytics, on the other hand, is often not nearly so latency sensitive, but often deals with much larger sets of data and therefore has a different set of behaviors and impacts on the system. You know, one of the things I don't like are slides with nothing but text. So I've actually managed to use Dolly this time to generate pretty looking pictures that when you look at them are almost always crap. It's very interesting. But like, ah, what the heck? Let's see what we can do. I think this does capture the right idea, which is in partitioning, what we do is we build something bigger out of smaller pieces. OK, simple enough. Basic picture caught that. One has enough words on it to be misspelled. It's very interesting to see how it misspells words. In Starting or partitioning is a process of dividing a database into smaller manageable pieces. We were doing this with key value stores. Key value stores are an instance of a database that is particularly amenable to this type of partitioning. It allows us to handle large data sets. It allows us to handle them efficiently. So your MacBook might not be able to do that. Of course, nobody has anything but a MacBook. I literally had this conversation recently where someone told me that most people in the world use Macs. And I said, it, OK. Except in the real world, most people don't use Macs. Mac has about 11% of the market right now. Windows is like most of the rest. But nobody uses Windows, right? I don't know. Then I was reading an article that you can actually take your Mac and you can install Windows side by side with it. You can probably put Linux on it too. Have the best of all three worlds. I mean, I, I use a Windows box because it has the best gaming support, right? Why does partitioning help us? It helps us because it allows us to increase our network capacity. By parallelizing our network activity, we can actually move more data than we can through a single pipe. Now, there are some limitations to this, obviously, because eventually this all aggregates into a big pipe. But the fastest data transfers come from parallel storage systems. And that's the reason for it, because you can actually parallelize out the network. Storage capacity is another issue, is that we actually have kind of some sort of limits on what we can put in a single rack. And so there's only so much data that we can store there. Now, the numbers keep getting bigger. Right? Seagate now announced that they've got, uh, what is it, 20 or 30, 30 terabyte drives. Little 30 terabyte drives. They use one and two terabyte platters now, and you continue to increase that number and the density. It's astonishing. You can literally put, um, a, you should be able to put an exabyte of data in a single rack now. An exabyte is 1,024 petabyte. Petabyte is 1,024 terabyte. We currently generate, um, I think the number is about four or five zettabytes of data per year now. And a zettabyte is 1,024 exabytes. 
And there are people who are working on the ability to store yada bytes, which 1024 is because we're going to hit that number sooner than later. We have yet to hit the um, we've yet to hit the inflection point on the how much storage can we possibly use curve. It's very interesting. And finally, CPU capacity. We can only process so much of this data so fast. So when it comes to things like analytics, analytics is where it becomes really important for us to have a lot of CPU power to throw at the problem. Some things don't require a lot of CPU power. It turns out that running transactional workloads is usually not CPU intensive, it's network intensive, it's IO intensive, but not CPU intensive, because they're small changes. You know, moving money from your account to my account. It doesn't take a lot, right? A few, a few words at most. So, in partitioning, you can find all sorts of different words, and I'm sure there are more than, than are listed here. Shards, regions, uh, tables, V nodes, buckets, E bucket. Okay, fine. It's the same concept. I got a, a, a container of stuff stored there. And that stuff is a database. It's some portion of the database. It could be the whole database. You can store an entire database. I'm sure you do. On all those Macs, you've got databases stored there because every application under the sun will use some sort of database. The file system is just one kind of database. It's not a very uh, RDBMS-y database. It stores blobs really well. A KD store is popular because it makes it really easy for us to partition the data. I've already said that. I'll say it again. Maybe I'll even make sure that it's a question on um, the final exam. Why do we use KV stores? We actually often aggregate storage in similar ways as well. Um, we take multiple storage units and we, we put them together and we split the data up and put it across them so that the failure of a single drive, for example, won't cause a loss of information. Now, you can set it up so that it will lose information. Uh, you can just simply stripe it with no extra overhead. You take two disks and you put you know, all the even numbered blocks on one and all the odd numbered blocks on the second one, or you know, the first uh, two terabytes on the first one and the second two terabytes on the second one. In which case then, if you lose data, if one of them goes away, then you lose data on both of them because the control structures. That's not a very good, good uh, example. Somebody yesterday asked me about, in office hours, asked me about why we don't just simply use erasure coding. So we're building these replicated systems. Why didn't you just use erasure coding? How many of you know what erasure coding is? There we go. Um, have you ever heard of RAID? Okay. So RAID has diff many different versions. There are a couple of versions of RAID that utilize redundant information so that if you lose a drive, you can continue to extract the information regardless of which drive it is. There are actually generalizations of this where you can actually set it up so that you lose multiple drives and you won't actually lose the data itself. The general mechanism for doing this is what's called an erasure. I'm actually not even sure what the etymology of the term erasure code is. I just know what they are. We use them a lot in storage. The larger and more complicated our storage systems become, the more likely it is that we're going to assume that not one of our drives will fail, but two or three. And we will build accordingly. When we begin to do replication across data centers at the storage level, at the, at the device level like that, there are erasure codes that will de significantly decrease the amount of storage we need to use. The trade-off usually is that the cost to recover becomes higher. If you have to reconstruct the data for a couple of dead drives, it means you're doing extra work. Uh, sometimes you're doing extra I.O., sometimes you're doing, uh, almost always you're doing extra computations. You have to figure out what the original data was not what the erasure coded version of the data was. The simplest way to think of this is that you can use parity. You take a block of data, 
and you spread that block of data out over four drives. First, first part of the, that goes here, the second part goes here, the third part goes here, the last part goes there. And then you have a fifth drive, and on that fifth drive, you have parity bits. The parity bits are based upon what polynomial computation is for the data that was in the previous four drives. And then you write that here. And that way, if any one of the drives goes bad, you can always get the data back. Because you can compute what it had to have been in order to satisfy the polynomial, not the parity drive that goes away. It's a simple example of it. The even simpler example of that would just be mirroring. I write the data twice. It solves a different problem, though. One of the things about erasure codes is if you try to look at how to build erasure codes for variable size data elements, your brain will melt. And we do it on disk drives because disk drives talk in quantized units, blocks. Usually when we're doing erasure coding, we're not even doing it on a block level. We're doing it on some sort of stripe level, like um, 64K is a very common number. So this idea of partitioning and sharding and, and, and replication are all common. See them up and down the stack. We are just talking about the layer of the stack where we're putting our databases, because this is where the distributed system part comes in. The benefit, I did like this picture. It's actually pretty good. Again, if there are no labels, it seems to generate pretty good diagrams. But if there are labels, they suck. Um, You'll see a couple of them made really small, so you can't tell that it's like misspelled partition with two I's and the R out in one case, and you're like, really? And your brain can kind of fill in the gaps. It's very interesting. I didn't really notice it initially. I started looking at them and going, wow. But I got some pictures on the slides, so they don't feel so texty. So we divide the data into distinct subsets. Each shard is independently manageable. Um, there's no one-size-fits-all solution to how you create your partition. So this is one of those things that you choose because it's appropriate for the problem you're trying to solve. I think after class Tuesday, somebody was talking about things like, there's no single solution to any of these things, are there? And I'm like, nope. You can spend your entire life building distributed systems solving the same basic problems over and over again, never use exactly the same tools. Slightly different, variations, changes here, there, because there are different things that you're trying to optimize for, different problem spaces that you're trying to solve. You have a set of tools to use, but you're not probably never going to use the same exact collection of those tools twice. One of the nice things about uh, partitioning is that we can, do par we can have parallel activity. Of course, that assumes some level of independence. If the data is completely dependent, you're going to lose your, your parallelism there. So there has to be some ability. It doesn't have to be 100% parallel, but it has to have some parallelizability. You have to get something out of being able to do things across these shards. Frequently, the reason this works is because routing things is a much cheaper operation than processing them. If routing things takes a lot of time and is very expensive, or alternatively, if processing is really, really cheap, then you're not going to get much out of parallelism. The benefit here is when the choice of, because you have to make that choice, where do I send this request? But there's always a routing decision when you partition. That has to be significantly less than the cost of processing it. Otherwise, it's not going to be worth the extra overhead. It also allows you to do dynamic re resourcing, which is really one of the reasons we end up doing this in distributed systems. So that means, I don't know, is slash dot still around? It used to be if you got slash dotted, your servers would crash because everybody would try and hit your website. And so the way we solved that was by building dynamically extensible servicing platforms. And the people who actually provide these things will watch. And when you start to spike, they may very well move you to a different server. What does it take to go to a different server? We have to change the routing table. We have to change how we route the requests that go to you. 
but it means now we can scale you up faster. In a world of virtual machines running on very large hard hardware, so you know, you're, you're, the VM you're running on has 128 cores. You've currently, you're paying for two right now. You get absolutely pounded and somebody says, we need more cores. They can move you, they can move other people to give you additional resources. And that will just be transparent to you. That's the reason that we go through all of this complexity of trying to build this stuff so that we can survive that. And moving machines, virtual machines, for example, moving them when they're running, so they don't have to shut it down and copy it and start it back up, is a lot harder problem than shutting it down, copying it, and starting it back up. But if it's your business, you don't want your website down for the 24 hours it takes to do that because it means 25 hours from now, no one's going to be visiting your website. And have you ever gone to a website that's down? Do you ever go back again? Sometimes. But if it's some, some fly-by-night outfit, probably not, right? You're going to be like, ah, oh, fuck them. They're stupid. They can't even get their stuff to work right. I don't want to trust them with my money. Um, and I'm, not in t I'm being a little tongue-in-cheek there, but I'm not entirely being tongue-in-cheek. I mean, one of the things that I remember, uh, Amazon actually measures what, and Google does the same thing, but Amazon in particular measures how likely you are to abandon the page if it doesn't respond to you within a certain period of time. And the longer that time is, the higher the abandonment rate. Literally, they know how much it costs if they don't get a response back within like 250 milliseconds. And they have an entire graph around that. So the ability to be able to dynamically add resources and solve Intention problems and improved performance is a real benefit here. It's very complex. It's why we end up talking about things like dynamic, dynamic resourcing and moving things around and rebalancing them and trying to do this all while the system is live. It's because somebody's paying for it because they're going to lose money if you don't get them that service. There are lots of different ways to partition data. I made chuchi drawings of, of three of them. Uh, the range is basically where you use some sort of key in your database, right? So you've got, a, you've got columns in, in each in your database, and you decide that one of them is going to be a key. You can shard based on that key. For example, maybe you've got um, a key that's dates. Are all the things that we sold yesterday. These are all the things we sold the day before. You could farm that data out based upon the date. Maybe you've got 365 servers and you put one day's data here on one server. Fine. If that's appropriate for the problem you're solving, that's a reasonable way of doing this. In fact, what often happens isn't that it's quite that simple. It's we take some existing key, then we run it through a hash algorithm, and then we use the hash algorithm to decide where we're going to put it. The reason we do the second one is because we don't actually have uniform spread in the keys. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to get enough entropy into those keys to spread things out. Because remember, when we're partitioning things up, it's so that we can balance things, things across our shards. If we get things clumping up, that's kind of a defeating point. So if you do this wrong, you could end up having 100 partitions, and two of them have 49% of the data in each one. That's not going to perform well. So how you partition is going to depend upon what you're splitting things up for. What you're splitting up is going to depend on the access patterns, the workloads that you're going to be using when you are accessing the data. See, there's sort of a whole feedback loop that's going on here. It's not like, well, you know, I'll just simply hash these things and, and, and go for it. When we do key value stores, it's very common for us to just simply use hash values. MD5 is typically good enough. The problem with MD5, of course, is that we know there are collisions.
You know what MD5 is. You know what a collision is. So when two files generate the same hash value, we say they collide. What is the probability that an MD5 hash is going to collide on any two arbitrary files? It's like vanishingly small. But some clever people at Google figured out ways of taking a file and then generating some extra stuff to shove at the end of it and getting the same checksum. So one of the things you can do is you can actually use the length. So the, the checksum and the length together actually um, are much harder to glide on. But that wasn't good enough. So we decided we were going to use SHA-1. And SHA-1 is now compromised. So we can have collisions in SHA-1. Now we go to SHA-2. SHA-2 is a family of hash functions. And so far, we haven't seen any collisions in SHA-2. Uh, we know it can happen, birthday paradox and all, but we know it's like super low probability kinds of events. But we're paranoid. We actually rely on some of the hash uh, values, checksums. We rely on them for things like, oh, I don't know, blockchain. Um, and so some clever people said, you know, what we really need is to have another algorithm that has comparable complexity to SHA-2, but uses a completely different algorithm mechanism for generating its hash values. Anybody know what that's called? SHA-3. And Ethereum uses SHA-3. SHA-3 was also designed so that it couldn't be done in hardware. Believe it or not. It's difficult. SHA-2 can be accelerated in hardware. SHA-3 cannot be accelerated in hardware. It uses a completely different mechanism for generating the hash values in a, a, a branch of mathematics called sponge function. Soak up things. Um, you can actually do explicit placement of, of the entries in your database, and that's fine. Okay, you can say, you know, I want this to go in this bucket, and that one to go in that bucket, and the other thing to go in the other bucket. It's it, it, fine. It doesn't matter. There are, are common techniques here where we might use a combination of two or more other strategies. It's very common for us to pick a particular key and then hash it. Well, I would argue that that's a composite then. We're not just using a hash value. Um, we could actually do the hash value of the content itself. There's a whole branch in storage of what they call content addressable storage, where literally you write a file, we compute a checksum for it, and then we give you back the checksum of the file. And next time you need the file, you go and ask for it. And we do the same thing in disks. Kind of weird. One of the reasons we do that, though, like in disk storage, the reason they started doing it was because it gave you deduplication. Any two blocks of fixed size using SHA-256, which is a, SHA, a 256 version of SHA-2, if you get another block of data the same size that has the same, same value, it's the same data. It's just statistically. Your likelihood of hitting a SHA-2 collision is lower than your likelihood that the disk just simply won't return the right data back to you. The bit error rate on disk drives is significantly higher than the likelihood of SHA-256 collisions. So we deduplicate. So if the blocks of data end up being the same, we only have to store it once. And it's kind of cool, because if you're building virtual machines, one of the things you might notice is that a lot of the virtual machine is exactly the same. Even if you like do updates at different times, and so, so the, you can start with a common image, and then you end up doing updates to it and whatnot, and then they diverge. But they diverge in such a way that the way they write to the storage has a lot of deduplication. So using deduplication for it turns out to be a big win in data center, which is why we do that. Uh, you can do round robin assignments. So you just simply say, this is where the next one goes. Or you can do it by capacity. This is the one that has the most space. So I'm going to put the, the next, next um, row in the, in the database is going to go here. OK, perfectly acceptable. Uh, you can use a directory, basically just a lookup table. It says, these keys go here. So when something comes in, you can look in the directory and you can say, oh, it's over there. Or you can look in the directory and say, I don't have that key. Fine. 
That's what the way file systems work, basically. Uh, you can actually do partitioning against the columns. This one's kind of interesting, but there are cases where what you really want to do isn't store your data in row format, but in column format. Of course, most databases, we start off storing it in row format, because that's what we're used to. So it's one row that we have an entry for each column, but we can equally store one column with an entry for each row. Or we can come up with hybrid versions of it. And this is just databases. This isn't distributed systems. This is just databases. The way it becomes distributed systems is because we are trying to split it up and partition it. That's what turns it into a distributed systems problem. Um, it's even possible to, to start your database using a functional understanding of how the data is going to be used. This becomes important in analytics. So if you know that you have analytics workloads that are really critical here, you can actually organize it so the data gets written to the right location to optimize certain kinds of analytic operations. I've now given you an entire universe of things that I guarantee you, you could sit and go from job to job to job working on projects to do the same thing and never do the same thing twice. There will be similarity, but they won't be identical. So indexing and partitioning serve two different roles in databases, and they do come into conflict because partitioning is about splitting things up and indexing is about efficiently finding things. So the challenge is, how do I do partitioning without completely obliterating the value of my indices? Indices are not free to maintain. When I add an entry, I have to add an entry into the index. You know, I can get away with the, the, the hack of organizing my data around the primary key. Talked about that very early on. Petrov talks about that. That's great for one, one key. Have any of you ever used a database? Have you ever used more than one key in a database? Almost always. Because you'll want to do that when you start doing complex joins. Because you're joining things across tables. You want different indices. And you end up with foreign keys in one, one row. And you use that to find the data in the other tables. Yada, 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 so on and so forth. So this gets complicated really fast. And if you do your partitioning wrong, your indices are going to be really expensive to maintain. And if you do your indexing wrong, your partitioning is going to break your indices. So strategies that they use for this include having local indices that are specific to the partition. But then you also have global indices that span the partition. And you can even partition a global index. Whoa. It's like running uh, IP over SCSI over IP. Because there's a SCSI over IP protocol, and there's an IP over SCSI protocol. And if two protocols are good, three must be better. So running IP over SCSI over IP is clearly faster. And I wish I could say no one has ever done this, but I've seen it. So partitioning is really good for scaling as long as you don't have to breach those boundaries. And that was the reason that I thought the graph discussion at the beginning of or just before class was really useful because it says, hey, Here's a case where you inherently cannot come up with a partitioning that isn't going to leave you with some cross-partition dependencies. So we end up spending a lot of time organizing and optimizing around minimizing those dependencies. So we minimize the number of cross-partition communications we have to perform. And I'm getting a little hand wavy here because this is going to depend entirely upon the particular problem you're trying to solve. That's why this is an interesting area. We've talked about partitioning. We've talked about how it gives us this great scalability. We've used key value stores, which basically punt on the indexing problem. Not my problem. I've given you a key value store. You're building a SQL database on top of it. You go figure your own indices out. So indexing gives us efficient lookup with extra IO. Partitioning gives us good scaling but it's limited by this cross-partition interaction. And the cost for both of them is increased complexity. 
The only reason that we're willing to pay the price of increased complexity is because we get better performance. If you're not getting better performance, why would you possibly want to use partitioning in your index database? That essentially means you're going to have to use a horizontal, uh, let's see, yeah, hor horizontal scaling solution. You're not going to be able to do backwards, vertical scaling solution. You have to make the machine bigger, put more storage on it, put more processing on it, put more memory on it. You don't get to build a bundle of little machines all talking to each other. That's what partitioning is. It's just those bunch of little machines all talking to each other that give us better performance. So there are a lot of trade-offs involved in using partitioning in real-world systems. If you're building a key value store, <laughs> you can laugh and say, I'm good with that. I don't have to worry about it, because that's clearly easy to partition. The layer above you that's using the key value store to build a SQL database or a NoSQL database, eh, they can deal with the problem. Not my issue. That's somebody else's issue. And then, of course, you find yourself on the team that has to build a SQL database that's sitting on top of that very interesting hyper partition key value store. One of the downsides to partitioning is its strength. We can add resources. When we add resources to it, we automatically create an imbalance. Let's see, I started with five servers, now I have seven, two of which are empty. So clearly, I'm not utilizing my capacity very effectively. So now I have to do the expensive thing. I have to move, let's see, 20% of the data off the first five and distribute it over the other two. So we want to be able to allow dynamically adding and even removing resources. I mean, in storage, no one ever throws anything away. So removing is the case that you usually punt until somebody's willing to pay you to do it. But seriously, I mean, I, shrinking things is far less common than growing things. You have to deal with the growing case first, pretty much. Design it. You architect it and design it so you, you, you can tell people, yes, we have a roadmap for providing shrinking. And then 10 years later, you get around to implementing shrinking when it's really hard because you've got 10 years of legacy code to deal with. So rebalancing itself can be very expensive. We have to ensure our data integrity. That was the problem in design project three. How do we move that data in a way that maintains the integrity of the data? And we were doing this in a simulator on a framework with everything in memory. There was no actual storage involved. In the real world, that actual storage involved is not necessarily going to be fast. So here's a question for you. When you look at the modern data center, do you think there's more SSDs or more hard drives? Hmm? Hard drives, why? Well, you know, it turns out that, in fact, it's not as big a price difference as it used to be. But it turns out that SSDs use a lot more energy. So part of it is the operational cost of what? The air conditioning. Air conditioning is one of the biggest consumers of electricity in the data center. Build these massive heat pumps to pull the data out, or pull the data, pull the heat out of the data center and pump it outside. And as we've seen, when that stops happening, things melt. That was the um, Microsoft Azure Australia. Right? So it's not a theoretical problem, it's a real problem. So we have to do this at runtime because we can't shut the system down to do it. Did you have a question? Press a button, yes. Because there might be, okay, so why would you do that? 
And you think of a reason why you might do that. Because you wrote the code and you don't trust your own code, right? Maybe you're one of those people who writes your own code and says, I would run my stuff on this tomorrow. And I wrote file system for a long time. And you know what? The point at which you're willing to put your own data on your own file system is a very monumental day. Usually it crashes the next day and loses everything, but it's a monumental day. File systems are a really good example because it takes years to stabilize them before you're willing to use them. But one of the reasons I would do that, and I know I'm interrupting you when I asked you to suggest it, one of the reasons I would do that is because I don't trust my own code. Um, automation sounds really good, and I bet we could build a nice chat GP front end for this that would automate it all, and would you want that to actually do your load balancing? No. No, you might at least make sure that you had someone in the review cycle, which is pretty much what you just described, someone in the review cycle who goes, no. Now, that is not going to be you on your first job, most likely, unless you're there for 30 years. That's going to be the kind of thing that you throw at someone who can look at it and actually say, no, I don't believe this software has worked properly. It's almost never a junior engineer. You almost always start with manual, and then you move towards automation as your understanding of the problem space grows. And I have seen this in storage companies, for instance, where they are very slow about automating some of the things, and they want someone in the loop early on. You're right. Eventually, you try to automate as much of this as you possibly can. But in design project one, it was very clear. When the primary goes down, secondary is not in sync, you don't automatically switch to the, to the half reconstructed backup copy, shut down, and you call somebody and you say, sorry, you have to handle this. The reason you put manual intervention in there is because you're not convinced this can recover correctly from that yet. Because even once you are convinced, there will be scenarios where it doesn't. Uh, GitHub. The GitHub failure, the GitLab failure, both of them much the same thing, which was they found that automated switchover to work right. That makes sense. So I'm sure there's some other reason, but that's the only reason that comes to mind right now. I don't trust the software yet. I mean, if I wrote the software, would you trust it? I wouldn't trust it. I've written a lot of software. I write bugs like nobody's tomorrow. If you don't want to write bugs in industry, what you want to be is someone in marketing. People in marketing do not create bugs in code. Replication and fault tolerance. I did like this picture. And it has no words in it again. Those are the best ones, the ones that have no words in them. Replication and fault tolerance provides us with, um, we, we, we achieve fault tolerance through replication with partitioning by, rep, by replicating the partitions. That's the design project two, which was a Paxos replicated key value store. And then in design project three, we built a partitioning scheme for our key value store on top of our replicated key value stores. So you can see this is essentially what happens is that we sort of keep bolting things on the top or sometimes on the bottom to make our systems more scalable, more performant. So replication provides data redundancy by having multiple copies and transparent failover. So interestingly enough, erasure coding is actually fairly efficient at its base utilization and data replication is fairly inefficient because it's data replication. We're keeping whole copies of it. And we're not keeping two copies of it, we're keeping five or 10 or 50. And then people come along and they add erasure coding on top of that to try and cut that number down. And there are clever strategies for decreasing that cost again. And if you come up with one of those, you get a nice bonus at the end of the year because you saved the company you know, $120 million. And here, as a, bonus, as a token of our appreciation, we're going to give you a gift certificate to McDonald's. 
you'll feel very appreciated when that happens. I mean, seriously, people actually do get significant bonuses for doing these kinds of things in the big cloud company because they literally can be talking about tens of millions of dollars saved. Then again, there's the friend of mine I was telling you about, you know, $150,000 worth of a um, mistake. And I finally got the story on that last weekend, which was that um, the senior developer told, told him to go and look at why there was this global variable that was not getting used. And if he couldn't find anything that used it, that he should remove it. So he went, he looked, he didn't find anything, so he removed it. And that senior developer signed off on the PR. And somebody else signed off on it too. But by golly, it turns out that this variable was tied into the way that shipping was paid for, for the products that were being produced. And that when the order came for one particular customer, it was supposed to go build against that particular customer's account, which was in this global variable. And it was only activated when some file that wasn't in scope got bloated. Now, I looked at it and I, you know, once I got the whole story, I'm like, this isn't your fuck up. Sorry, but you know, a senior dev looked at this and said, do it, and you did it, and they signed off on it. You know, you're going to learn something from it, and clearly, Clearly, he learned a lot from that. He was concerned that he was going to be the next to take, get the axe, you know, they're going to lay him off. And I'm like, why? They just spent $150,000 educating you. So my point here, lots of complexity here. It was PHP. Do I have to say more? And you know, the saddest part is I... As much as I loathe PHP, there's still quite a bit of it in use. I've seen code bases with VAX, assemb uh, yeah, VAX assembly still in use for a computer that isn't manufactured anymore, but there's still code being maintained. There were PRs against it. I looked at that code base, and at one point I realized that the code base had dates in it that were before it was in a Git repo, it had codes in the repo that had dates before Git was invented. Yeah, there's a reason these kinds of things happen. And the older the code base is, the more likely you are to run into those sorts of bad, bad, bad things. So the cost of, of providing all of this robustness and the scalability and this dynamic uh, uh, management of, of moving your data around is that you've increased your, your complexity. The software complexity is going through the roof here. The reason that this is a hard field is because we're doing something that's difficult, we're dealing with failure cases, and now we're layering all sorts of different demands and requirements on it. So we need to have a good replication strategy, we need to understand our consistency model, and we have to determine how we're going to be routing and handling requests so they get to the right shard as quickly and efficiently as possible. How hard could it be? Oh, and by the way, this is your capstone project and you have four weeks to get it done. And this is why I keep saying, I'm not expecting the earth on the capstone project. This is why I'm trying to emphasize the design. I think if you focus on the implementation, you're gonna get too lost in the complexity of the details. You're getting too lost in the details to understand some of the higher level complexity issues here. So that's why I think it's more important to keep looking at these things and saying, how do I do this? How do I solve this problem? The fact that I can't make it run really fast in a, a six week cycle in a class, who cares? No one's ever gonna use that code. Well, except for one, there's always going to be one class of this size, their, their code will get used, maybe. Um, so we have to worry about routing and query execution because we're applying these operations to our database. The requests have to go where they need to be processed. So operations have to be sent to the right partition. We take whatever is being asked for figure out what's being accessed and send it to the partition that, 
that owns that particular piece of data. You can use partitioning keys, you can use maps, you can have a special routing layer. All of these things are used at various levels, and sometimes a combination of them are used. You can use fixed, fixed routing. Consistent hashing is a really popular one for key value stores because it allows you to add and remove nodes. Notice that that remove is there, not get implemented. But you're going to design for it. You can use a lookup table. That's just a form of directory. Interestingly enough, you could actually ship some of the information out to the client and have the client decide where to send the request. And if they do it wrong, you can send them back a message and say, I'm sorry, you've sent it to the wrong, wrong machine. Anybody here know that there's a protocol called um, the Hypertext Transport Protocol, HTTP? Ever heard of it? There's actually response codes in HTTP that say, you sent this to the wrong place. There's one that says, you sent this to the wrong place for now, so go over there and they'll, they'll handle it. And there's another one that says, sorry, this one's been permanently moved. There are 300 codes, and they are literally redirects, what they're called. So they redirect you to a different location. So you could do that. And the client sends it the wrong server, you tell it where to go. There are even mechanisms where they rewrite the queries. This was kind of cool. I was like, really? Yeah, they'll actually take a SQL query and rewrite it so that it's partition relative. OK. One more translation layer. Um, so when you have multi-partition operations, things that actually have to be performed by multiple partitions, you need to have some way of submitting the queries to multiple partitions to be processed or to be partially processed, and then you need to aggregate them. This becomes your map reduce stage. You send things around to where they need to be processed, and then you take the results and you bind them back together. This is where I think SQL rewriting could make a certain amount of sense. And finally, don't forget that we have to deal with the whole replication failover problem because the queries might come in and they might go to some place and then it fails. How do we recover from that? How do we get back to that? We have to hide the details of this from the original client. The, the client is never going to care about how we partition things. Well, almost never, except when the client does. The client almost never cares about how we've partitioned things. What the client cares about is, I want you to do this. And the system should go and do this, even though we've got all this dynamic behavior underneath here. So that's why I'm talking about these different ideas, like, you know, like redirecting. Partitioning isn't a new idea. It's been around for a while. It started out in the 1960s, where we created completely disparate namespaces and glued them together. Essentially what we do today in Unix with file systems, right? We Blue the namespace. We have databases that started showing up in the 1970s. I know this is all ancient stuff, right? Nobody was even alive then. I think there were still dinosaurs wandering around. Definitely dodos. 1980s. Somebody said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could take like a bunch of like cheap disks and put them together and make a big not quite so cheap disk. Ah, that's cool. So they did this redundant array of, I always heard um, inexpensive, but independent is another meaning for the I in array. Independent or cheap, expensive. In the 1990s, we really started getting into distributed databases because networks became much more common. Networks existed prior to the 1990s, but the only people who had networks were people who were like in the military or in academia, very specialized. None of you are old enough to remember dial-up. You remember dial-up? Right, exactly. Like, you know, there was only one phone line in the house, and so if you wanted to dial-up, people would be like, Get off the computer, I need to make a call. Literally, stuff like that. Um, 
again, you're too young to remember when AOL sent everyone a CD, AOL software on it. Dial into AOL. AOL is still around, but you can't dial into AOL anymore. It turns out that dial-up is still actively in use around the world, believe it or not, as strange as that might be. But yeah. Okay. Now we're starting to get into, you know, sort of only the, the distant past as opposed to the ancient past, which is distributed databases. These start really showing up as the networks start materializing and storage capacities became larger. I mean, 1989, 1990, when we were designing um, the file system I was working on, the largest drive we could buy was a gigabyte. And they were expensive, a gigabyte. And so when we were designing, we said, well, let, let's, let's assume that we're going to hit a terabyte in the lifetime of this project. File system's still alive, and guess what? Our byte disks are very commodity now. Probably cheaper than a one gigabyte drive was at that time. Databases have become larger. Networks have become faster. We started building data centers, so we began to see an increase in distributed databases. How do we scale our databases up? How do we replicate them? How do we protect them from failure? Into the 2000s, we see people coming up with clever new ideas about how to organize data beyond the relational database. We have NoSQL databases. NoSQL databases include things like document databases, document stores, uh, graph databases, and vector databases. All of those are commonly used alternatives to SQL databases, RDBMS data. I mean, a key value store is a NoSQL. It doesn't have any structure, has no query. It is really, literally, what you put behind a web server for puts and gets. That is exactly its interface. In the 2010 range, now we're at least getting into your lifetime. 2010 timeframe, we start to see um, Data centers, wow, I haven't, I haven't worn that t-shirt yet. I have a shirt that says, um, there is no cloud, just somebody else's computer. Really the truth. Have I worn the Linux one yet? Okay, so who says, dad, what are clouds made of? And, his, and dad says, Linux servers mostly. And it's pretty much the truth. Um, so we have cloud databases, you know, cloud-based databases. The databases are the same databases we would have run on our own computers, and we do run on our own computers. It's just that we gave them a web API of some sort so you could actually make calls across the internet to access this database. And that has enabled the vast ecosystem in which we live now where all of these applications, every single one of them that we have, talks to databases sitting inside of Azure or Amazon or Google or IBM or Oracle or yada, yada, yada. And this is where we see sharding and replication become a really big thing. Now we're here in the 2020s, which is at least you know, the, the past, and we see um, real-time processing databases and vector databases have popped up. Uh, vector databases have been around for a while, but nobody had any really good use for them. And then suddenly, um, we got large language models, and they were like, oh, this is great. We have a way of putting tons and tons and tons of feature data in this graph database. Graph databases, are, I'm sorry, vector database in this vector database. Vector databases are really good at computing locality. So when I say features, it could be, you know, you have how tall are you, what color is your hair, what color are your eyes, blah, blah, blah. And you get to collect enough of these things, and then we can find all of the other people who are similar to you like this scary article that showed up on my feed this morning that said that how much data we can infer from you even without actually knowing your name. Oh, yeah. All right, so the last thing, longer than I thought it would be, the last thing is really what are your workloads? What are you optimizing for? Because this is going to definitely impact the way that you end up designing your solution. And there's really two very common classes of workloads. Now, there's lots of variations within each of these. 
There's a transactional workload, which has, it's typically used for online transaction processing, has high concurrency, requires fast queries, uh, has strong safety guarantees, asset safety guarantees. That's because usually these things involve money. And in money, people want to make sure they have strong guarantees. Um, I don't know who it was, but somebody said that they went to an interview um, and they were asked about the CAP theorem and then to design a database for a banking application. And then the joke was that they suggested eventual um, It was nice to at least see that, that we've been talking about these things and have an intelligent, hopefully have an intelligent conversation about them at this point. Uh, they often use fine-grained locking because, of course, that's how we're going to guarantee this kind of strong safety, no collision on the operation. Uh, they use indices to optimize access to the data, and they have small transactions. They're not doing big changes, they're doing small changes to databases, which actually in some ways makes some of these problems easier. Versus the analytical side, where what we're doing now is we are actually walking through large volumes of data, trying to extract patterns from it, trying to find out behaviors. How do we build re recommender systems? We crunch tons of data. I was just talking about uh, vector databases. A vector database is a natural way of encoding information that we can then use to suggest the next movie you want to watch on Netflix. It's not the only way to do it, but it turns out that vector databases are very effective at doing that. And we put tons and tons and tons of data in that stuff. And then we crunch it down and we say, OK, people who liked the movies you liked liked this movie next. So we'll put that on your, on your list. So this is complex analysis, lots of data, often used for business intelligence, which seems like an oxymoron to me. But um, Businesses are trying to decide what products to build, how to sell things to you better, what pricing they should have, so on and so forth. Things they need to know in order to run their business more effectively. The queries are often very complex here. And they can be iteratively complex. As we learn more, we go back and we keep making our, our queries more complicated, more specific, because we're trying to figure out how we use the last six things you bought to determine whether or not you're likely to lease a Mercedes next week. They're often read intensive because we're analyzing the data. We're not updating the data. We are analyzing the data. So we're mostly ingesting it. It's mostly a read workload. So that changes things because our OLTP environment is actually often a write workload. In analytical workloads, we often don't care if things aren't quite up to date. So we do get relaxed consistency here. If I don't know what the last three movies that somebody rated in the last 20 seconds were, for calculating what I should recommend to you, it's fine. The data that I have is sufficient for me to be able to recommend something to. They often use columnar storage, and they are often batch processed because I don't need real-time results back from these kinds of large analytical operations. I mean, I literally have read papers that talk about both of these kinds of workloads because they are both important, and they end up leading you to radically different designs. And then, of course, somebody will come along and say, I want both. And that's always going to force you to compromise somehow. You're going to have to decide which of these two is driving the primary, and then figure out how you can achieve the secondary goal without destroying functionality of the primary goal. And that is a lot more than the time that I actually expected to take. When I was first looking at this, it's like, it's like a 24-page reading. It's not very long. But it's a good place to be talking about these things now, because I feel like we've been talking about details here, so it's good to step back a little bit and to say, what does the landscape look like? How are we going to be using these things? I know you're all itching to get out there and work on these kinds of projects because you heard that you're going to get paid a quarter of a million dollars a year. I didn't promise that. I don't know, anybody got a job in a distributed system field yet? Anybody got a job that's paying a quarter of a million a year? 
Well, that's good, because you can't barely even afford to live in Vancouver on a quarter of a million. Questions? If not, we're done. I'll see you on Tuesday. So we have class Tuesday, Thursday, and then we skip Tuesday, and then we do another Thursday. So you're going to get more of these kinds of conversations. I'm pretty much out of material in the book to cover. I'll go back through it and make sure I haven't missed anything. But I was thinking I'm going to talk about blockchain maybe next Thursday. Partially because I got slides talking about blockchain that I can just steal and use. Um, all right. Have a good night then. Get something to eat, stay dry. And I'll say goodbye to the people at, who couldn't be bothered to come in and see us. Dream is done.